a uh, little slide issue there. Sorry about that. I'm going to start over. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Erica Oriens. I'm the executive director of the Center for Student Success at the Michigan Community College Association. Thank you for joining us today for our first workshop uh, to support our Strengthening My Workforce Pathways work. Uh, I am uh, joined today by uh, my colleague Donna Petrus, who is working with us at the center, and several of my colleagues from Jobs for the Future, who will be talking about our content today. Um, as a way of doing welcome and introductions, uh, we have enjoyed in this project in particular, um, asking folks to include their name and institution in the chat along with one industry credential you have earned or maybe currently have. Um, this has been a fun way to learn about folks' industry credentials and it's okay if you don't have one too. Uh, I wanna also thank our generous funders from the Ascendium Education Group who have supported this work at the center and support um, a lot of wonderful work in higher education across the country. So thank you to Ascendium. Uh, this uh, work that we're doing now is part of a broader project, um, and I'd like to uh, spend some time today sharing with you the, uh, our strategy around this and the big picture around supporting colleges and their efforts to award academic credit for industry credentials. But um, we probably don't have a lot of time for that today, so I've shared a link here uh, to a webinar that we hosted in December. Um, this link is to that recording that provides a comprehensive overview of this aspect of the project. Um, and I would encourage you to go out there and look at that. We also featured uh, three community colleges, uh, Grand Rapids, Northwestern, and Macomb Community College um, on that webinar as well. And so I think it's, a, it's really worthwhile to review that. Um, I also, because of this larger project, I wanted to share some information with you about other work that we're doing. Um, in addition to helping colleges award academic credit for industry credentials, um, we are also doing uh, some work with a small co cohort of colleges who are um, examining some labor market data and analyzing their programs. We are working with several uh, public universities and independent colleges to award, uh, excuse me, to um, help students transfer into bachelor's degrees from our applied degree programs. And then we're doing some work around um, uh, helping students with career exploration as well. Uh, this video here is a very brief 15 minute video that provides an overview of that whole project if you're, if you're interested in learning more. So with that, I'd like to pause. I'll stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to Brianne. Brianne? Hi all, I'm just gonna take a minute to share my own screen. So let me get up, get set up with that and move this over. <laughs> oh, I'm at the very end. All right, um, so everyone can see my screen now, I hope. Um, awesome. Thank you all for having us today. I'm Brianne McDonough, and I'm excited to be here um, sharing this important work around industry recognized credentials and sharing some examples for equity, equitable policy considerations as Michigan looks to increase the number of um, credits that they're awarding for industry recognized credentials. Um, and just to take a minute to introduce myself, I am an associate director at JFF and my work centers on the intersection of work and learning and my portfolio really covers and focuses in on helping community colleges become more workforce aligned in a variety of ways and I'm excited about this project in Michigan in particular, because it relates to some of the prior work I did when I worked on TACT programming in Massachusetts where I served on a statewide working group that was um, doing policy work and implementation work around credit for prior learning for the state. Um, and I will pass it to my colleague, Jessica, to introduce herself. Thanks, Brianne. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Soya. I'm a senior program manager with JFF. 
And my portfolio really focuses on technical assistance and professional development, thinking about strategy design and implementation across our network of stakeholders, including community colleges. And before coming to JFF, I actually lived in Lansing and I uh, worked at the Michigan College Access Network and I focused on our community mobilization portfolio. So if any of you are familiar with LCAN's local college access networks, um, I used to lead a lot of that work in the state. And it's great to be here. And I'll turn it over to Bitsy. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everybody. Thank you for um, being here with us today. I'm excited about this quick hour that we're going to go through here. Um, my uh, name is Bitsy Cohn. I am uh, uh, officially retired out of the Colorado Community College System Office. I worked um, at a community college for 22 years, and then I was with the system office for another eight. And I consult these days in um, a number of different things. Right now, I'm in, a, in the middle of a very large um, uh, project with the state of Colorado on um, credentialing. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of crossover for me on that. But my background to um, help with today is that I, for the last 10 years, have been involved in prior learning assessment and the many, many, many ways that we're working on implementing that at institutions. So I've worked all over the country at helping um, colleges and systems and states um, really examine um, implementing prior learning assessment and especially looking at policy development and implementation kind of activities that allow you to get this work done on the ground. So that's really my, um, that's my area of expertise. Happy to be here today. You're muted, Bree. Classic slip up. Um, so today, as you might know, this is we're going to be talking about the institutional policies as part of session one. And this is a four part workshop series. So we hope that you'll um, will get you interested and you'll continue to join us and have your colleagues join us for these other workshops coming up in June and August. Um, and with that, I'm going to share the, our agenda and then we'll jump into the content. Um, so we already got through the welcome and introductions. Um, we're going to share a little bit about the policy review and discussion based on the pre-exercise that we shared, if you had the chance to do that. And if not, we'll spend a little bit of time walking through that together. And then we'll go into part one and talk about the student experience, the importance of policy components and the key considerations. We have two examples that we want to share from Michigan Community Colleges, and then we also have some state and system policy considerations um, or how they play out on the state and system level um, and some examples to share around that. And then we'll do part two, which is turning our attention to your own institutional processes. Um, we'll talk together and have a discussion about what's happening on your campuses and areas for improvement there. Um, and then we'll share some additional resources before we wrap up and close for the day. And with that, I will pass it to Bitsy, who is going to do our exercise review. And I'm going to also share the link to that in the chat. And Bitsy, if you decide you want me to pull it up on the screen, I can do that as well. Okay, I think that um, what we had understood was that you might have gotten that a little bit um, later than we anticipated. So you probably um, might not have had a chance to look over those materials and or to fill in the worksheet. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what it is that we, we sent. Um, we wanted you to take a look at that information and to think about yourself as a student from the student perspective. Um, identify your college's website uh, for prospective students interested in earning credit for industry recognized credentials. And the reason that we go through this, the reason we do this is because the student journey is more important than any of the rest of this in terms of making sure that the, that the um, process happens. So the best laid policies, the best laid plans um, don't work very well if we don't have the students at the center of the, in, of the question of how do we access this information? How do we do this? So thinking from a student perspective, what I wanted you to look at in terms of the worksheet was taking a look, there's two parts to it. One of them is a student journey and the other one is the, um, your kind of, um, uh, uh, your experience. And to say how easy, how difficult, how, um, how well 
right now does your institution do with helping students find answers to some pretty primary questions like if I have an industry credential, um, is it going to be worth credit at this institution? Um, and I asked questions in that worksheet initially to things like how many clicks does it take to get to any kind of information about credentials, about um, what it takes to get credit for a credential? Um, what do you need to do or who do you need to talk to? These are the things that students would wanna know. How much does it cost? It's one of the first things they ask. How much does it cost and how much time it takes is more important than anything. Um, are there limits to how many credits they can use? These types of things. So on the worksheet, and I'm gonna encourage you to take the time to do that after today and to look at your own information, the information that's available to you and make believe you're a student and to see, you know, do I have answers? Can I get answers to those things from a student perspective? And then for yourself, looking on to that second page of the worksheet and saying, how, what is my experience of this? Do I know where the information I need to be able to better counsel students or to help students find this? Um, does the institution have existing policy that I need to be aware of? Um, is there information about what the process that students engage in? Maybe I don't have anything to do with student intake, but I would wanna know what the student knows before they come to me. I always think about the student journey as, um, where were they before they came to me? What do they need from me when they're with me? And then where am I going to send them when they're done with me so that I can help them get to the, to the, the outcome of credit on a transcript for their prior learning. So then the other piece of that then, and go ahead and change um, slide three. The, the next thing we'll talk about that is that the other sheet that I gave you was that it's, um, it's headed equitable policy considerations for credit for industry recognized credentials. And what I was asked to do was to envision some of the, the main points, the key components of a solid policy for you to use. And a lot of it has to do with how you build your own policies at your institutions, but it also has to do with having the pieces and parts in place that cover all the bases on this. And if you haven't already, although I think that you've had a lot of conversation about this, you'll have come up with some of these topics and said, yeah, we need to have an answer to that. And then having those things firmly placed in policy becomes very important. So the first of those is this idea of standards and values. The most important um, I'm, I say that too much. I've been told I say that too much. Everything's the most important. I need to be more, uh, more uh, careful of that. But at any rate, the most important thing um, that I think of when we're looking at this is having standards and values around the evaluation for sure, around the types of processes that you engage in, in looking at these things. Because it's very easy for a transfer partner, for instance, to poke holes in your process if you don't have something in your standards that says, this is how we do this. This is how we evaluate. This is how we track information. So thinking about standards, thinking about the issues of quality, making sure that when you're looking at a credential that you have already decided what a quality credential looks like. And there's a huge amount of resources out in the world right now about how do you decide if a, if a credential is a quality credential? How does it align to your own curriculum? Um, thinking about transparency and equity, that the information that's available about these things is wide open and available to everyone, to you, to students, and to all students. There should be a set of shared definitions, and this is kind of standard in any policy, but you want to sit around a table and talk about it. What are the things that when you first heard them, you thought, I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean. The word credential, believe it or not, is something that you better, you better describe. <laughs> um, people have such different viewpoints about this credential, certificate micro credential, badge, all of these different things. What does that mean? What is a credential to your institution and, to, and it goes along with your policy? Um, you agree upon the definitions and then you have a better conversation when you sit down at the table and start talking about how do we evaluate those. So start with those. Um, let's see, the, the marketing and recruitment, again, the best laid program, the best laid policy is, is not accessible to the student if they haven't gotten the information about eligibility, if they haven't gotten the information about how do I access this system. So having things like, um, having things like transparency in terms of um, end users. So is all of our information on the website? And if it is, is it up to date? Are students going to be able to find what they need? Is there information there about who to talk to if they have questions? Um, is the information that I put out there current in the sense that they're not getting information that we've changed in any, any way or any time? Um, we want our stakeholders and our partners in this because industry is hugely involved in this whole process. We want them to be able to find the information they need. And so how are we putting that out in the world? How are we marketing it to our partners and to our students? The application process 
part of what you want to look at in this, and I, I'll, I'll lean heavily on this, that some institutions don't choose to do an application, some do, but I really encourage you to think about that. A, a good deal of the reason why these kinds of initiatives don't work well on the ground is because we don't think about the efficiencies of scale. So if we're thinking that, you know, well, in the past, we've only had one or two people come a semester with this. Well, that might change if you're actually organized around it and if you're actually encouraging people to come with these credentials. Are you going to be ready for that? Are you organized in the sense that you have an application that, that they can fill out that gives you the information you need? Are you able to tell them very early in the process whether they're qualified for it or not so that they don't go flying through the process and then find out that they're not? Um, are repetitive tasks, are duplicated tasks standardized in such a way that you you, you're not passing something on to uh, the next person in the chain of the, the student journey and then they're having to repeat the work that you just did? So having those conversations, what is that? What are all of the steps? What do they look like? And how do we scale that so that we're not duplicating? What are the key metrics that we're collecting that are gonna make sense for everybody in terms of this process? You can go to the next slide, please. And then looking at the credential evaluation itself, one of the key factors in this is that faculty subject matter experts have to be the evaluators. They don't have to touch every credential and decide on every single credential every time it comes in, well, yeah, that's the right one, but they should be the ones who initially look at anything that comes through and say, yes, that's an equivalency or no, that's not an equivalency or they've got most of the information they need, but I don't see these competencies. We have to think about these things. That we go back to that first idea of trust and standardization, that a big part of that is saying that the subject matter experts who are involved in this are the ones who are saying it's equivalent. It is not an uncommon practice in a lot of institutions for the transfer um, evaluation specialist, the transfer evaluation person to be the one who makes those kinds of decisions which might work when you're looking at something that's in a catalog for a gen ed course, but it might not work when you're looking at something like a, a highly technical skill um, that's certified in some way and that you wanna make sure that the certification is up to date, if it's the kind of thing that fits with your classes. So it should always be faculty. And then the communication between faculty and registrars needs to be really tight. So that because the registrars are the ones who put that credit on the, on the uh, student record. And then to the student record, Part of what you make a decision on in, in terms of policy is well, how are we going to code this? How is it going to go into our student information system, our student management systems? How are we going to put it on the transcript? Is it going to be um, transcripted as resident credit? Is it going to be transcripted under the fold as um, transfer credit? How, is, how are we going to look at that? Um, does it? How do we um, take into account any kind of residency requirements that go along? And typically, they um, these types of, of policies need to mesh with a transfer policy because it's often seen in the same light. How do we accept um, how do we accept these credits into a student record so that they fit within the in the larger scheme of things? So registrars are incredibly important in that process. Um, having an established grievance process and what that's about is partly it's about being able to say I feel as though I could have. Um, you know, I, I might have turned in a credential, but you said you wanted more from me. I feel like I could maybe turn in a, a an application or a proposal or a portfolio that would give you more information about why I think I'm qualified to earn those credits. Um, so sometimes it's a grievance around that. It's clear it needs to be clear where someone does grieve and where they don't. That you know, to be able to say, like for instance, it is standard practice across the country that if you have an evaluation process that costs anything for students, that the evaluation itself is, is what makes the cost. So you don't get to get your money back if you don't pass the evaluation. It's like taking a test and not passing it. You don't get your money back for that. And it should be very clearly stated before anybody sits for that evaluation, things like that. Um, so thinking through that, how does the student come back and say, I think I could have done better? or when they come back and say, you need to give me my money back because you didn't give me credit, that you have an answer for that within policy. Uh, I had a supervisor a million years ago who used to say to me, policy is our friend. And I didn't think that was true because I hated policy and I especially hated writing policy. But I have come to understand from a supervisor's perspective over time that it is important. There are things that, you know, they always talk about, you know, shutting the barn door. Well, not shutting any barn doors. This is, this is cleaning out the barn before the horse gets out. Okay. I, I really mixed up that metaphor. And the last one would be um, having an evaluation plan. So credentials especially, especially have shelf lives. And in some um, 
in some disciplines, they last longer than others. You know, if you're in the IT discipline, it's not going to last very long in terms of credentialing because they, they time out to some extent. If you're in welding, for instance, or if you're in auto, they're a little bit shorter. They have a little bit longer time life, um, shelf life, but they almost always all have some kind of a shelf life. So what does that look like? And again, you go back to your faculty um, experts and you have them make the decisions about what that looks like and what has to happen. Okay. So you can go on. And next, I'm going to pass this over to um, Brianne. Awesome. Thanks, Fitzy. Um, so with that, we would like to just kind of take a, a moment, let this uh, these policies kind of sink in a little bit, um, and we're going to move us into a quick Jamboard exercise. Um, I'm going to be sending the Jamboard link in the chat and also opening it here on my screen. So after seeing the presentation of the eight policy components. Um, I'd like to hear from all of you. Um, There's 75 people on the call, so we should get some good um, participation. But what do you think really makes a good policy? What are some of the key components that you, you're keeping in mind that stood out to you? And you can just add, um, if you've never used a Jamboard before, um, you see my cursor over here on the left and you can add a sticky note here by clicking sticky note and it just pops up and then you can add it on the board. Thanks, Brianne. And as folks are thinking and typing, I just want to elevate a question that we have in the chat. Mary asked, uh, do we have to have faculty review if we are using CPL for elective credit? So the, this is the kind of thing that you're going to put into your policy. So there's going to be a, it's going to be varied things. So if you have faculty review, um, if you have faculty review a credential and that credential is going to be used over and over again, then you make a decision to have a crosswalk and say this equals this, and we're going to stick with it for a while. If um, ask the question again, so I make sure that I don't lose the lose the train of thought. Jessica, yep. please. Do we have to have faculty review if we are using CPL for elective credit? Yes, and I'm going to say I'm going to say one of the best things you can do for your students is to use as little as possible elective credit awards because they don't really serve the student very well, um, or they're the the way that they can serve the student is limited. They don't typically transfer very well if they're going to go someplace else, and so thinking about that is another reason why you want to tie faculty in. Are we hitting on the, enough of the competencies that you would give them credit for a course that you have? Is there something they could do to enhance their learning that then they could get more credit for this or they could earn that credit? Um, so faculty are the key to that. They don't have to, again, they don't have to do every single one. If you have faculty create a rubric for you to use that says these are the things that need to be part of this and you see that they've, they've met 70% of that rubric, then if the faculty have said these are the competencies that need to be met and you feel confident, then you give them the credit for that. But faculty make the decision about what the competencies are, what the equivalencies are um, as part of the conversation. But again, I, I'm not, I'll tell you, I, I overemphasize it when I'm teaching this to say as much as possible, try not to use elective credit um, over, over much because it's not as much of a benefit to them. It, and there, it does have some unintended consequence down the line. Thanks for elevating that question. It was interesting. Um, I also think some of the unintended consequences I'm thinking about just sort of that transfer issue that could arise later on in the process that might be unintended. Um, so I'm just going to read out some of these um, responses. Thanks to everyone that added. This is great. Um, so what's standing out is just um, Clear language, clarity, I think we're seeing that in a couple different cases. Um, the importance of working, um, what does it say? Oh, the ability to have stuff available and clear on the website that students can access. Clear timelines. Credit expiration, yes. Um, that grievance process, which is really important and maybe not often realize that that should be included. Um, what do we have here? A well thought out and efficient and effective structures and navigation system, um, protocols in place, helping students maximize their value through credit, 
um, and how that can be leveraged for academic something. Equity through access. This is great. So I'm glad to hear that a lot of the policy components that we presented resonated in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, does any, oh, someone's asked another question. Um, so could you talk more about the transfer issues? I've heard some people say that if there is even a 1% chance that you might transfer, don't bring in credit for prior learning credits. What do you think of that, Betsy? Um, I don't know about that. I, I think that, that you can best support the student in terms of the student who is on a pathway and trying to move forward from your institutions out into um, a four-year institution to say the first line of defense is always to transcribe credit in such a way that it will transfer well. So if it's that you're receiving institutions accept everything that's in prior learning, that's great. If you're receiving institutions do a review of these courses before they take them in, then they should be um, above reproach. That's part of why you have a system for, for um, evaluating them. The other part of that is to say that if, if the student decides to go to a transfer situation and that elective doesn't meet their major credit, they might transfer it as elective, but they then might have to get other electives that fall within their majors. They, they run the risk of being over their 150% on financial aid if they've accrued too many credits around those types of things. Um, there's lots of reasons. If their terminal degree is the associate's degree and they're expected to get 12 credits in electives, that's excellent. But many of them have um, different ideas. And also we don't want to assume that they're not going to at some point want to go back. And we want to make sure that they get the best bang for their buck when that time comes. Thanks, Bitsy. Um, there was also just a related comment that um, says universities won't transfer prior learning unless it's tied to a specific class. And usually the class is um, transcripted which makes sense. And I, I think it is always, I liked your point, Bitsy, about if they're going for the associate's degree and they're earning that whole degree that will transfer as a degree into a BS program, then it's not maybe as critically important as if they're doing these one-off standalone courses that they're trying to get credit for. Um, so I guess it's, maybe, it's, it's best just to understand what the students true goals are and have that conversation with them and ensure that it transfers as best as possible from the outset. Okay, so we're gonna move away from the Jamboard and we're gonna come back to the presentation. And so as we were going through and preparing, you know, we wanted to lift up some examples from Michigan. So we found these two excellent uh, examples that um, Jessica, I don't know if you can grab these links to share them in the chat as I'm talking about them. Um, Maycomb Community College, and I'm not sure if, if anyone is here from these institutions too that wants to feel free to chime in. Um, Maycomb has a student landing page for the industry recognized credentials. And it includes a comprehensive list to course equivalencies and a student request form. And Northwest Michigan College has a similar, a CPL landing page for students, links to a clear student procedure um, for how they would earn credit for their credentials. And so Maycomb's, um, their student application is pretty specific. It, documents the timeline for which students can earn the credit for the credentials. It's typically within three years of the award date for that's the standard they've set. Um, the policy for students to apply, it, it includes the policy for students to apply and, and their eligibility criteria. Um, that refers to if they have to be matriculated um, and if they that and if there's any uh, maximum number of credits that they can seek to be awarded. Um, it clearly outlines the cost associated with earning the credit for credentials. And in their case, they waive all tuition and fees um, for awarding that credit if students are able to earn them. 
Um, and then they have uh, clear course equivalencies that are mapped to the credentials. Um, this is an example of their student acknowledgement form. They have this form online that just makes it really clear for what the student's role in this process is and what the student's expectation is so that it's very clear what the student needs to be prepared with when they go to seek um, credit for their credential. So specifying some of those policy components. And they also are asked to acknowledge this by checking and signing and submitting this form. Um, and then we have the Northeast Michigan example. Um, so in this case, the, I mean, another great example, the policy and the procedure is very clearly articulated to students. Um, it states that students must have their application for credit signed by a lead instructor or the department chair, which I thought was an interesting um, piece of the policy. And the certification, similarly, they're mapped to equivalent course credits and students receive, um, students receive transfer credit, but no grade is assigned. And then this is an example of the application form at Northeast Michigan or Northwestern Michigan. Um, you can see that it lists the procedure for students and it asks them to state which course and the title of the course and the number of credits that they're seeking for the credential. And um, Jessica is sharing these in the chat if you want to just kind of open them and reference them for later. Oh, and before we get to that page, we're gonna do another Jamboard activity. So I'm going to ask Jessica to share that link, um, the new Jamboard link, and I will open it here. Thanks, Brianne. And so as we're opening up uh, this new Jamboard, um, if you're still in the previous one, you can just click the arrow over and you'll go to the next page. We'd love to hear um, you know, from these examples, from what we've shared so far, what stands out to you about how the policy is communicated to students. Um, so please share. And while you're doing so, if there's anybody who's on the Zoom who's from Macomb Community College or Northwestern, um, you know, feel free to chat in or even unmute yourself if you want to share a little bit more about uh, the policies that we shared too. And Erica, um, you're welcome to chime in and elevate your comment if you'd like. Thanks, Brian. No, I, uh, I just we're we're aware uh, the Center for Student Success has been involved in a lot of statewide transfer work, and so we're aware of how important it is that uh, if an institution is awarding credit for credentials or any other form of prior learning that as students are increasingly interested in earning a bachelor's degree that those courses will transfer um, or at least uh, the student you know, won't, won't need to repeat those courses. So in our uh, the transfer agreements we're developing for applied degree programs, we are uh, that's one of our top priorities is to make sure that students uh, are getting credit for credit that you awarded at the community. Students are getting credit at the university for credit that was awarded at the community college. That's great. Thanks for adding that, Erica. Um, very important work for the, that equity component too, to make sure, right, that everyone is able to access this type of credit, even if they are attending a university or they've gotten that credit from a community college. So we got a few responses trickling in. Yes, I think I'm jumping in and, and saying that real quickly that that um, one of the things that happens too, because we're talking about industry credentials is that you're looking at transfer and articulation to industry to and from. So that's the other thing to think about is are you accepting, are you uh, reaching out to your industry partners and saying, 
did you know that your people with this certificate can earn a degree with us and start with X number of credits, which is a great marketing tool, but also that we are training people under these um, categories that are equivalent to this certificate, or we're training people to these certificates. If you want to help them continue on to a degree, here's the way that we would stack that. It, it's the kind of, um, the kind of two-way conversation that really increases those partnerships. And the key word is always articulation. Write it down and, and call it out. Say, this is the way we'll do this and this is what the students will get. And it's, a, it's very attractive to industry. Thanks, Bitsy. Um, as folks are continuing to write in on the stickies on the Jamboard, I just wanna elevate the word I see most here is clear, 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 clear. And so uh, that seems to really be resonating with you all. And um, as we transition to our next slide and revisit some of those policy considerations, I encourage us all to really think about what makes this policy clear. Um, there's gotta be a standard definition there. And so thank you all for chiming in. And with that, um, I'll turn it back over um, to Bitsy. Thanks, Jessica. And we'll go on to the, the next slide when Bree's able to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just to, to remember, and I, I apologize for the one, 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 one. Not sure what happened there. Um, the, the, um, these are the eight things that we just talked about, about the components that are important or helpful for you to remember. So let's go on to the next one and talk about another example. And this one I'd like to point out, or that I pointed out is, this is one of my all time favorites when it comes to credential, um, prior learning for credentials. The, the um, Ivy Tech Community College system, which is actually, it's 46 locations and 19 full service campuses in the state of Indiana. It's really huge. And they have always been um, uh, created as a core around technical education or, or applied sciences education. So there's some things that go on at their institution that are great, um, um, I think great um, templates for the rest of us who are trying to do this as part of what we do, not just all of what we do. They have um, developed over time, I think that they've been at it for about 15 years now, they started out looking at just the, the very simple idea of when we look at a credential and we say it's equivalent to some kind of credit, how do we make it more efficient by putting that someplace so that people can take advantage of it instead of having to continuously reevaluate those credentials? And so they very, it very minimally started a credential crosswalk for the institutions to look at and say, your colleague so-and-so says this is equivalent to this. That has grown over the course of the last 15 years to be this incredibly um, actually nationally recognized system um, that students can engage in. If you um, Google Ivy Tech prior learning assessment, you'll see what I'm talking about. But they have a fully developed crosswalk and it's extensive. They've partnered with a couple of different companies to create a technological inter interface for students where they can um, find out very quickly and very easily what they're eligible for in terms of how their credentials and their, um, their um, demonstrated experience can translate to credit. Um, map to sectors, map to fields. They've really gone way beyond the initial stages that we all start with around how do we make this more efficient and how do we get more students involved. Lots of transparency and policy requirements and costs to students. You can go to the next slide. The, this is what the, the kinds of things that you'll see. And again, you go out on that site and you'll see all of this. It's totally worth your time. I get all excited about it because it's. I've, I've brought it up at a few places where we were talking about developing better systems. And I've used Ivy as a, uh, an example often. Um, they have a number of different ways and links and costs and all of these kinds of things, but it's always like, again, there's that word clear. It's always very clear and very transparent. All of the information is there that you would want to see. Um, my, my, um, the other thing that they do that I think is a great part of, the, of a model for us to look at is that they are very proactive about this. They don't just wait until a student shows up with a credential. They go looking for the credentials that associate to their programs. They list them, they evaluate them, they get them up on their crosswalk in anticipation of students bringing them in, which is huge in terms of students getting in quickly and easily into these um, credit opportunities. And they also are, um, trusted as a trusted source because what they've done over time is they've collected a lot of information about this, a lot of information about their students and have looked at how well does this work for students and 
really often, if you follow these guys, you can see how they improve their practice over the course of each, even a semester, never mind a year, that they go back and they look at their stuff. That whole idea of evaluating what you're doing and making sure it stays, um, it stays relevant and it stays timely. They're very, very good at that. So you can tell I'm kind of a cheerleader for Ivy. I'll, I'll let Rianne talk about the next thing. All right, and another great um, model to look at is CUNY's ASAP model um, and their, excel their accelerated study in their associate's degree program. Um, the way that they're incorporating the acceleration is through programs such as credit for prior learning by allowing students to receive credit in um, a number of ways, including through industry recognized credentials. I really wanted to present this specific slide so that you could see an example of how people were talking about the metrics behind this. Um, so, and in sort of the key retention components. So students in CUNY's program are more likely to persist. Students who engage in credit for prior learning take an additional 17 credits on average. Students are more likely to graduate overall with completion rates um, being 17% higher for those that take CPL and even higher for students of color. Um, it's 24% for Latinx students compared to 17 for just the general population. And it's also saving students time and money with, um, with 12 credit for prior learning credits students can accelerate their deg degree completion by nine months for the AS degree and by 14 months for a bachelor's degree. Um, so when you're thinking about making the case for credit for prior learning and awarding credit for recognized credentials, industry credentials on your campuses, think about the metrics that are presented here and some key performance indicators that you can rely on. And with that, I will pass it to you, Jessica. Oh, no, wait, I'm going to back to Bitsy. Just kidding. <laughs> no worries. So we talk a little bit about Colorado. Um, I'm, not, I'm in Colorado and I, this is when I was working with the system, this is the work that I, I did. We developed the policy, we developed the, the system-wide 13 colleges um, policy. And um, some of the key components here are listed. And, um, you know, part of what I, I think the bigger picture viewpoint of this is that we at the community college system started with creating policy and creating procedures that would work for the community college students. And that's, um, you know, it's the largest system in the state. So there was, we're talking about a lot of students. So part of what we did is we said, you know, there are always gonna be issues of transfer, but we said, how do we best serve our students? And we came up with this policy, we created it, it's, out, it's, it's online, you can take a look at it. But what we also ended up doing because of that is that it created a precedent for the higher, the higher education um, system. So the Colorado Department of Higher Education and the Colorado Commission on Higher Education took note of this and then ended up emulating the exact same policy across the state and included all of the four-year public institutions. And that was a huge lift for everybody. And it was based on the, the strength of the policy that was created at the community college system. So it's something to think about as you're trying to expand out with your partners. But um, I, would, I would suggest you go ahead and take a look at it and see the types of, of pieces that are in there. We talk a lot about, um, pushing things out to students in a good way. We talk about the clarity, the costs are included. All of these elements that I've talked about are included in that. And if you go to the next page, Brianne, I'm sorry, I keep, I keep shortening your name on you. Um, <laughs> policy statement, um, one of the things that happened out of this that was really excellent for us is that it was taken through board policy. And that means that all of the 13 community colleges in the state, which are governed by the board, would follow that policy. So we could be incredibly consistent with our students. One of the gems that's buried in that policy is that any student that earns credit through prior learning at one of the institutions can have that, that credit transferred without further evaluation to any of the other 13 institutions. And that has been a huge plus for the movement that students, that our, many of our students are quite transient around the state especially for our rural students to be able to earn credit at the rural colleges and to come out to the more urban colleges to be able to um, 
go forward into their major um, fields, it's been huge. And then we also adhere to some really tight principles. And one of the biggest ones of those is that we're talking about learning. We're not talking about teaching and we're not talking about um, the way that we currently, um, or we have for a long time viewed learning as credit-based. So before we talk about a credit equivalency, we talk about demonstrated learning. Skills, knowledge, and ability are, are the, the um, key factors that we look at, not credits, not seat time, not um, how, you know, who taught it or how, how we judge how it was taught. Really, it's about, um, about uh, demonstrated learning based on our own competencies. And then the next piece, the next slide shows um, just a quick screenshot of a questionnaire that we create. We, we call it a questionnaire, but what it is is an intake form for the institutions where the student could go out and fill in their, their kind of core information. Remember I talked about having something that um, would put together that duplicated types of activities and information. We put that information together and then it's also attached to the matrix that we created around credit crosswalks so that if a student for instance puts in that they um, have a, an AWS one certificate then we can show them that we have an automatic crosswalk in the system to the first of the two um, basic welding courses. So they could get credit for that. If they wanted to come back to learn, to um, earn their, um, if they wanted to study about getting their AAS and welding, for instance, that they could come in with that certification and it will get them on the road for doing that. And it's part of this where they can find out the information. Okay. You're up. <laughs> So right. now we're going to move back to the Jamboard. And so Jessica is going to lead us in this piece. So here's the Jamboard on the screen, and I shared the link in the chat. Thanks, Brianne, uh, and thanks, everyone. So as we're wrapping up our, our rapid <laughs> one hour session, we want to reflect on uh, you know, the eight policy components that we've learned about, the statewide examples that have been shared, the Michigan examples that have been shared, and then the system level examples that have been shared. And think about that and uh, the ways in which you can apply some of those to your own institution and to your own work. So with that, um, look at the Jamboard, in, in your experience with your college, which college level policy components are missing, um, which need to be revised so they exist, but they could use some work. And then which of these are fully developed? Um, so take a minute, reflect on, um, on what you're thinking based on the learnings from today. And then we'll take a few minutes to share out what we're seeing. And I'll just add uh, to make sure that you move your sticky note to the appropriate, underneath the appropriate um, header. Since we don't know, we can't tell just by looking where you wanna file it. So, so far we're seeing, I think, um, Two things that are missing, marketing and, and positioning awareness, equity across programs, oh, industry credential equivalencies that are visible for students, okay, uh, some things that need to be revised, specific industry credentials equated to actual courses, oh, training of advisors needs to be revised, okay. Great. I mean, what I'm seeing as like a general theme here is, you know, everyone's really thinking about the institution as a whole and kind of taking this out of siloed pockets, uh, which is great to be thinking about when we're thinking about, um, you know, really transforming institutions uh, and to align a little bit more here. Um, Brianne, Bitsy, what are you all seeing? Anything you want to share out? I think that the um, calling out the idea of training, not just for advisors, but for all of your people, it's one of those things when you look at that, um, that first policy point, we talked about standardizing your practice, that um, having all of the people who are responsible for the evaluation on the same page in, in terms of what quality is and what your standards are will um, elevate everything that you do in the institution because it can be trusted. I was also going to point out equity. I think, you know, there's a lot of different ways that this can come through, but 
where I think there's opportunity is kind of thinking about incorporating industry recognized credentials across different program areas and not kind of focusing on those easy wins in the tech fields, but also tackling some of those other um, career pathways that might lead to skilled trades or other opportunities that aren't concentrated in one specific area. That's a great point. There's a whole bunch of conversation going on nationally right now around, uh, around the um, certifications that Google is creating and teaching and awarding and how those fit into so many of the liberal arts areas, which we don't necessarily anticipate. So if we're working through gen ed requirements and what if a certificate that they earn someplace else actually fulfills gen ed requirements um, in a way that it meets the criteria of the competencies, what about if we said that certificate can also meet these things? Great, thanks everyone. And thanks, um, Bitsy and Brianne. Brianne, did you wanna add something else? No, I was just gonna take us to the next GM. Perfect, yeah, this is a great transition. So um, in thinking again about your individual commitments at um, your institutions, we'll share another link to the Jamboard. And so what will your commitment be? What can you identify to refine, revise, or develop college policy for industry recognized credentials? So take a minute and we'll do the same thing. We'll share out on some observations and hopefully this will help um, give you all some next steps to think about as, as we continue forward with this series, especially. jump in there and, and I saw one that it was talking about the cost benefit. Um, it's huge when you think about how you will adequately resource what you're trying to do to make sure that you have at, at the very least an elevator speech in place that says this is why this is a worthwhile thing for the college and for the leadership to do because at some point you're going to have to resource this and say this is how we're going to do it and this is why it's worth doing. Um, so taking the time to look at that and to look at your rate of return is really uh, crucial. Great, so we got, some, we got some action items to follow up on from everyone. I'm sure others of you are kind of thinking where is the best place to prioritize our time and energy. We have a question in the chat that'll pull up. This is how will we address university partners not accepting credits without letter grades attached. I think that the, the best mechanism for getting um, university partners to accept any credit is through articulation agreements where you can sit down and talk about the content of the credit, um, where you have a chance to outline for them what that actually means. Then they're gonna, you're gonna build their trust and you're gonna build their confidence that what everybody wants to know is, will the student be prepared when they come into my class? Are they getting what they need to come into my class? And you need to be prepared to answer that question for your receiving institutions. Um, and many of them don't mind if there's a letter grade attached because credit and transfer is always C or better. And if you set your standard in, your, that's the other thing that you can set in your policy. If the standard is that credit awarded is always considered C or better, then you can create that trust again with your institution saying this is proficient or better and what you would accept and transfer. And all they're interested in transfer is content. So ride that wave. All right, I'm gonna take us away from the jam board and, but I would like you to continue thinking about what is going to be your priority back on campus and who do you need to engage to make steps towards um, building out those policy considerations. Um, we're coming to the end and I wanna leave just a few minutes for Erica and Donna, um, but I wanted to share these three resources for folks to look into. Um, the first is uh, Kale and CBEN resources. 
uh, resource that recently came out in March. Um, it's called Partners in a New Learning Model, Competency-Based and Credit for Prior Learning. And it talks about many of the implementation components to rounding out your credit for prior learning strategy. We also have the ACE um, Council on Education Crosswalk, which many institutions use to help them do that mapping that many of you are interested in doing. Um, they provide curriculum crosswalk and guidance for faculty and college administrators. And then lastly, um, with the college, the, the Colorado Community College System, uh, they have a prior learning assessment credit manual and a very robust PLA crosswalk matrix to check out. And with that, don't forget to join for the next workshop. Thanks so much. And I will stop sharing so I can pass it to Erica and um, Donna. And as I'm doing that, I'd love to just get um, a quick reaction from folks using the little emojis on Zoom. What did you think of our session today? And um, did it meet the learning outcomes that we were striving for, which was to teach you about the policy considerations and um, to have you consider action items on your own campus. Go ahead, Erica. Great, thanks, Brian. While you're all doing that, I just want to cover some next steps. Um, but before I do that, I want to thank Brian and Jessica and Bitsy for this jam-packed uh, information. Uh, and thank you so much for all of the other resources that you linked out to as well. Um, and I'll just note that uh, those are available on our website. Uh, if anything's not there, you can always reach out to us uh, and, and follow up. Um, but I have a couple of next steps that I wanna cover. The first being um, take all of this. I know most of you have institutional policies for how you award credit for prior learning, um, but please take this and spend some time thinking about those opportunities that you have to update your institutional policies using uh, the resources that we shared with you today. Uh, as Brianne mentioned, uh, please uh, go out there on the MCCA website and register for all of the upcoming workshops. Uh, we will, uh, I saw many of you on the Jamboard referencing in, uh, the equivalencies, need to establish those equivalencies, which is so timely because that's what we'll be talking about on the next workshop in June. So, uh, and then we'll be revisiting that conversation about the student experience. And, and many of you also mentioned the marketing and communications piece, which is exactly what we wanna do in August. And then we'll spend some time revisiting um, the how we've aligned credentials um, once we get some of that work done over a few months between June and October. Um, I know how overwhelming it can be to think about all of those different ways to award credit for prior learning. And if you've reviewed our uh, launch meeting um, and some of our other resources about this project, you'll know that what we're really trying to do is support colleges in their efforts to award credit for industry recognized credentials. Um, and what we really want colleges to do is start thinking about how, what industry recognized credentials you prepare students for. So I would encourage you um, between now and June to identify a list of courses from your college catalog that prepare students to earn an industry credential. Uh, so let's start with the courses that we teach that prepare students for an industry credential. Um, those might be in industrial trades, IT, cosmetology. Uh, there's a variety of different programs that we offer uh, where students are awarded, uh, where students are, are trained to either sit for an industry credential or receive um, a license or certification. So just, as some, just something to think about right now to prepare for that next workshop. Uh, I've provided some additional links and resources here to the MCCA website, and uh, you have our contact information. Um, and with that, uh, we are looking forward to seeing you um, when we get back together on June 2nd. So thank you all very much. Thank you also to JFF. Thanks everyone. It was great. Good.